So this morning we've got a session about urban and architectural acoustics and very delighted to welcome Francesco and Austin who are researchers in the school um, and they'll, they'll explain the, the, the whole program for today. Uh, one thing just to note, we're not using... Oh, we are using it. Yes. Oh, we are. Okay, we are using that as well. Okay. Um, the session, this morning session is being recorded as normal. This afternoon session will not be recorded because it's a much more involved session. Okay, I'll hand you over to Francesco. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, I'm Francesco and I work here within the Acoustics Group. I'm a postdoc researcher here. And this morning we will be giving you an overview uh, about some basic design principles for acoustics, both from the indoor and the outdoor uh, perspective. Uh, this will be a very light touch. Uh, I mean, we don't want to uh, scare you with uh, equations and this kind of stuff, so relax, take it easy. It's going to be fun. And uh, we will be talking for a while, roughly 40 minutes, say 40 minutes, and afterward it would be nice if you could give us some feedback and some suggestions about how do you think you could integrate these aspects into your design uh, studios. Um, in the afternoon session, this will be much more practical. We will have a listening experience. Then, if the weather condition is fine, we might have some recording session outside. Uh, I don't know whether you downloaded the app. Um, afterwards, we will have a measurement session of the reverberation time. That is one of the parameters that we will be talking about this morning. And then I will introduce you briefly to a software for a 3D sound propagation for an interior uh, application. Okay, let's get started. So, why architects should care about acoustics in general? I mean, uh, this is a tough question for 10 a.m. in the morning, but in general, why do you think we are here? Setting apart for a moment that this is mandatory for you, but uh, why do you think that we should care about these aspects? I mean, one answer could also be, well, actually, we don't need it. It's useless. Any suggestion about this? Why, in general, we should care about acoustics? Of course. This is a key point, it's function. Okay, this is something we will be talking about. Uh, so, my answer was very simple. I mean, we should care about acoustics simply because we have to. Like it or not, sound is there. Um, generally, architectural design is dominated by vision, and it's mainly about organizing the space for the human experience. Well, actually, sound is part of this experience, so we should consider it. And um, honestly, I have a background in architecture, but um, when I first approached acoustics, I was very fascinated by the idea of actually designing something that is not actually there. You cannot see it or touch it, but still, it's part of this experience. Uh, now, before we go deeper into building acoustic stuff, uh, just a few concepts, very few concepts about sound and sound pressure level. What is sound? Okay, let's imagine we are in space, we are immersed in a space, and it's a quiet space, there's silence, nothing is moving, it's moving, and uh, we have a point, we will call this point monopole, okay? Monopole will be our best friend for the next few hours. Um, this point is boring. boring. After a while, it has a lot of energy he wants to share with this environment, and after a while, it will start feeling uncomfortable, okay? And it will start increase its volume and decrease its volume. Now, since we are not in a vacuum space, there is air around, this expansion and the uh, contraction will generate some variation, some gradient in pressure around him. And this variation of pressure will propagate to the rest of the space. As a consequence, a number of waves with different lengths will start propagating in the space. Now, a lot of things are happening on these paths. Uh, but generally, 
these paths, these waves, will eventually reach a receiver. That, where, that, that is where architects, architects come into play, because uh, generally engineers are most, uh, mostly interested in defining what's happening here, these amplitudes and these paths. Uh, and when they use uh, to consider rece receivers, they usually put microphones there, but we like to put human beings. Okay, so basically, uh, we have some units of measurement uh, for this variation of pressure, and since it's a variation of pressure, usually it's Pascal. But uh, since we are not interested in, the, in, a, in an overall pressure, we will only consider a reference pressure for this sound field, okay? So this is why we are using decibel. Decibel is a logarithmic, logarithmic scale. Uh, that's a relative measurement of this variation of pressure. Um, yes. Generally, how can we characterize these sound sources? Basically, we have two main areas. The first one is the frequency domain. Okay? These frequencies relate to the, to the wave we have seen here. Okay? So each of these bands, these are octave bands, each of these relate to... Uh, Actually, these are third octave bands, but uh, this relates to the waves we have seen before. So one aspect is the frequency, and it's more focused on energy, okay? The amount of energy that is included within each band. And the other aspect is the time domain. So basically, this is a variation of the amplitude that we have seen before. So this amplitude, this variation of pressure is varying over time. And this is the time history of the signal. Okay. So let's listen to this for a second. Sounds like a cup of tea, right? But it's boiling water, okay. So, this bubble noise, as you can see, has a main contribution in terms of energy in the middle frequencies, okay? So you have this peak around 500 hertz. Hertz is the unit of measurements for frequency. I assume you heard about it. Let's move to the next one. So in this case, time history is not providing us with very useful information. You can see a lot of variation of amplitude, but it's not very useful. If we look at that, this is different. So, in this case, you can differentiate, distinguish some pattern. These are kind of the waves you were hearing to. And in this case, the contribution of energy is kind of shift towards high frequencies. Okay? Before it was, the peak was around here, and now it's much more even, okay? around 1 kilohertz of frequency. Last one I want to show you is the bird. Okay. okay, so here, this is typical for uh, this kind of sources. You can see this pattern, like slight increase and then some spots. Uh, from the energetic viewpoint, you can distinguish some tonal components, and then the main contribution of energy is very much in the high frequency range, around two, uh, uh, between 2 and 4 kilohertz. Okay, this is just about characterizing by the physical viewpoint the sources, but these are sounds. What make sounds become noise 
then this is up to us. I mean, it's about perception. Um, sounds in general are nor bad nor good. It's our perception that makes them turn into bad things, into noise. The common definition for noise is unwanted sound, kind of unwanted source. The wrong sound in the wrong place, in the wrong moment, for the wrong person. Um, I mean, I tried once to bring my grandfather to a metal concert and our perception were, were slightly different, so it's about perception. Um, moving towards acoustic design, as our friend before was saying, uh, first we have to consider the function. Okay, so if we focus on the space and the activity that is supposed to take place in this space, then we can make better decision uh, in terms of acoustic design. We can generally split uh, acoustic design into two main categories. On one hand, uh, we would have what we call acoustic buildings that basically are spaces and environments for which special requirements are needed. I, I have to reach a uh, decent um, quality because the function of these spaces is focused on acoustics. So concert hall, for example, classrooms in this case. Uh, can you hear me properly? Apart from my accent, I mean, uh, if you are able to hear me, this is because this space has an acceptable uh, acoustic quality. And for this, we will be using some parameters and indicators. Okay, some pressure level, reverberation, we will focus on this afterwards, clarity, definition. These are parameters related to proportion of energy within the spectrum and the time of uh, arrival. Uh, intelligibility, how many words I can distinguish within a number of, uh, within a speech. Loudness, diffusion, and of course background noise, because we always have to consider that we are never with silence, that it's always something. I don't know if you can, if we are silent now. I can distinguish at least two, something is going on there, and then there is the fan on the projector. So background noise is a very important parameter to consider. And then on the other hand, we have non-acoustic buildings. That is, buildings and spaces that are not specifically designed for acoustic purposes. But also in this case, we do have to consider some acoustic issues because sound, or in this case noise, could affect the activity that is supposed to take place in this space. And this is the common example for housing, for example, when you have noise coming from uh, outside. And also in this case, of course, in this case, parameters will be different. We will not be interested anymore in the definition of the sound, the clarity of the sound. We will consider other parameters, like the insulation that the material is able to provide. Uh, sound pressure level, of course, and insertion loss, for, for example, in the case of noise barriers, and background noise again. So, designing spaces for high acoustic performance is always about finding the proper balance between the aesthetical issue and the acoustic performance issue. And this is something that uh, any architect can experience at any level. I mean, also Rem Collas was thinking about that. Um, what does it mean? to design acoustically. Basically, it's about reaching optimal values um, for quality. Okay, so if you think it from the thermal viewpoint, what if you have to design the thermal environment? You know that in a closed environment, you usually have comfort when you, in winter times, when you have around 22, 24 degrees, am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Uh, so for acoustics it's the same. Um, design from the acoustic viewpoint means achieving some values, okay, optimal values. How can I achieve? How, how can I achieve these ideal acoustic parameters? Basically, 
I can work on the geometry of the space, and this will affect the reflection patterns, and we will see in a while what this means. And the other aspect that I can consider is materials. Materials will be affecting the amount of energy that will be reverberating in the environment. Most of times, I cannot work on geometry because geometry is given. So usually I tend to work on materials. Okay, unless I'm not designing the concert hall, for example, where I can decide, okay, walls must be in this way and this kind of stuff. But just to announce you want me to choose this to put in the photographs. This is the Berlin uh, Philharmonic. <laughs> And uh, this is a personal citation. This is a uh, uh, Royal Theater of San Carlo. So, what do you think uh, about uh, the architecture and acoustics? Well, both are very interesting, but in this case, uh, in the case of Teatro San Carlo, this worked much better before any refurbishment was made. So, there are a lot of people uh, thinking that uh, after they, because they changed uh, the chairs. Now they look much more modern with modern materials, but actually this was not the case in the 70s, uh, so in the 17th century. So, yeah. Both these spaces are designed for acoustic purpose. And, uh, yeah. From the architectural viewpoint, you can notice, appreciate the difference in terms of aesthetic appreciation. <laughs> I, I think the example of Berlin is yeah. quite frequently brought up by acousticians as yeah. being an absolutely awful yeah. example because it, it, it's architecturally interesting, interesting but not but working. From an acoustic point of view, it's absolutely the worst in how you design it and that much more theatre. Yes. Is the shoe, uh, shoe box? Yes, oh, shoe box. Yeah. They knew. They knew. So they didn't. They didn't need anything else. So it was fine with this. Uh, yeah. Few words about the physics of materials. Basically, when you have a surface um, and you have an incident sound, this sound will impact the material in a point. Now, what's happening is that part of this incoming energy uh, will be reflected, okay, and the angle of reflection will be the symmetric angle with respect to the normal of this. So imagine you have a normal line here, normal to the material. So this reflected sound will have the symmetric angle with respect to the incoming sound. Part of this uh, sound, this energy, will be absorbed by the, by the material. That means that it will be converted into other kind of heat. energy, heat in this case, okay? because nothing is lost. And part of this will be transmitted to the other side. Okay? So ideally, if we make one, the sum of these three components, we can define these three components as a fraction of one. Okay? So in this case, let's say that 0.5% of this sound is uh, reflected, 0.3 is absorbed, and 0.2 is transmitted to the other side. This is valid for each frequency. Okay, so when we think in terms of absorption, uh, reflection, and transmission, we should always refer to the frequency that we have seen before. Okay, so the same material will be absorbing, say, 50% of the sound at a given frequency, say 1 kilohertz, but the same material will behave in a different way at other frequencies. Okay, so keep this in mind. Uh, yeah, basically we have different technologies for absorbing sound. The most common are porous absorbers, uh, but we can also develop some kind of technological tricks to absorb sounds. Okay, so 
for example, this is called Elmox resonator, and it's typical for this kind of high frequency. So, for example, you have to imagine that the sound is coming here, and then this is a trap. Okay, so sound will keep the spreading energy in this and not being reflected. Okay, so you can think about many solutions. So in, uh, this is not exactly absorption, but from the perception viewpoint, you can, you can say that that portion of sound is absorbed because it's lost. It's dispersed by the material. Sometimes you don't need to absorb, you need to reflect. Okay? So in this case, you will look at materials with very low coefficients of absorption because you need to bring energy to some place. Okay. And uh, scattering is another phenomenon. Uh, when this uh, surface of impact is crispy, uh, rough, usually this reflection will, these reflections will not be uh, unique. Unique. Okay. You will have kind of reflections in all directions, and this is scattering. This is providing uh, diffusion, okay? Because the conditions and the parameters that we are talking about usually are very local, but we should try to achieve a sound field that is as diffuse as possible in some cases. So reflections. Um, when you have a sound and a receiver, uh, we can split again the sound into two main components. The first component is the direct sound. So the sound that is traveling from the source to the receiver with no obstacles. Okay, so this is the direct sound. But reflections also play a very important role because they bring more energy to the receiver. Uh, if you were in the corridor, for example, and I was speaking here, you would still hear me. This would be because of reflections, because actually you are in a shadow zone with respect to the source, that's me. Um, about the geometry and how to control this kind of reflections, uh, as I said, when we have flat surfaces, basically you consider the normal to the surface and the angle is the same symmetric with respect to the incidence. When you have concave surfaces, because of this shape, reflections, and of course the angle is always the same, reflections will tend to concentrate in some points. These are called focal points. So if you feel that that corner is missing some energy, you can somehow shape the walls and surfaces to bring some energy there. And in the same way, when you have convex surfaces, you can spread some away. Okay. Uh, I found this on the internet. Uh, this, this was made by SketchUp, I guess. So, as you can see, these people were having fun with this kind of surfaces, so possibly you have to think about the orchestra here, and these side elements are to bring energy in this area, because of course these reflections are working in the three dimensions, so you both have, con have to consider side effects and also ceiling effects. Okay? Then we have something weird here. Can you guess what these two boxes could be? Lights. So, sorry? Louder? I don't think so. Actually, I think these were meant to be traps as well, kind of. I would imagine that some absorbing material would be here. Because maybe the people that were designing this had considered that, okay, I need this to bring sound here, 
this to bring it sound here, this to bring it sound here and here. But then this, if I had a close surface here, maybe this sound would, would go back. And this is not what I want. So for this specific direction, they must have considered that that sound was not necessary. Okay, so they might have put this in order to lose some energy. Um, if we move to non-acoustic buildings, the first uh, option, the first uh, issue, huh? I mean, the first issue is uh, acoustic comfort. So um, basically, I don't want to be bothered by unwanted sound. Uh, I decided to put this example here because, um, for example, in housing, the typical uh, complaint is for uh, noise coming from outside. Okay, so a typical issue also for uh, building physics would be, the, the, the first, the more immediate solution would be to open the windows, but that would bring more noise in. So for example, architects could focus on developing some uh, models and uh, windows in order to let the air in, but not the sound. So in this case, for example, you have these shift uh, surfaces with some absorbing materials here. So the air can go through across the window, but the sound is absorbed. Okay, this was just an example. Uh, also, another example of non-acoustic spaces, restaurants. Uh, in this case, the function is not speech, but conversation. So you want to conversate with your neighbor and uh, not to be bothered by the rest of the people. So in this case, they put this kind of absorbing island, absorbing ceilings, uh, on the top of the tables, over the tables. Uh, reverberation time, uh, this is affecting quality as well. Um, yes, what's the definition? Uh, the definition of reverberation time is the time that is required in, in seconds for the average sound in a room to decrease by 60 dB, dB after a source uh, has stopped um, generating sound. Um, Yes, uh, there are some formulas for calculating this. Of course, this is, it's good to design this in advance, <coughs> because otherwise, if you don't control for the reverberation time, you will have a mess. Uh, I'm going to skip this. So there are some ideal values for RT, reverberation time. So for example, depending on the function, you will have different optimal uh, reverberation time. So for speech, we can say that the range between 0.8 seconds and 1.3 seconds is good, but more than two is unacceptable. It's making the, the, the words non-intelligible. Uh, of course, this is different for music, okay? You want, you want higher reverberation times for music because this is generating a good sound environment. I'm going to provide you with an example. This is um, an example of three dif different reverberation times in the same uh, space. That's a small classroom of roughly 150 cubic meters. So it's the same it served. Okay, did you spot any? Yes, the first was awful and it was 2.5 seconds. 
the second excerpt was slightly more acceptable. Indeed, it was 1.3, but optimal value was 0.8. That makes the sound more intelligible for speech. Uh, yes, then I have very few... I just wanted to show you this as a creative approach, you know. This was a student trying to make a studio, a recording studio into his apartment, so uh, you don't necessarily have to be very scientific, okay? So a creative approach is also good. And now we are making a step outside. Colors are not there. Uh, my name is Ersten Axelsson. I'm a psychologist from Stockholm University and uh, have been doing a fellowship here for two years. Uh, and we'll talk about the outdoor environment and some creative approaches that we are trying to, to use. Uh, I will start with this. Anyone who knows what that is? Anything we have seen before? Some would say GIS, but it's something very specific. It's a noise map of London. And the way to create these noise maps is simply by measuring the amount of traffic flowing along the, the roads. And from that you calculate how much energy that will produce. So you, you, you count the number of cars and how fast they're driving. I also need to know the proportion of passenger cars and heavy vehicles. And based on that, the physicians simply make a cal calculation this is, my, this is the amount of energy we will have in this place, and this is how it propagates. And from that, we create these GIS maps, which looks absolutely awful on the screen. I'm sorry about that. <coughs> the problem I have with this is that it only relates to one sound source, traffic. And this is the way we manage the acoustic environment today. It doesn't include any of this. Uh, you can probably recognize what that photograph is showing you, the Peace Garden. The only thing that would be included in a noise map from the Peace Garden, on what you see in the photograph, would be the buses and taxis in the background. All the people, all the water sounds, if there would be any wind or if there would be any bird sound, would not be counted. So noise maps are the way we actually manage the acoustic environment in, in the urban environment today. Uh, ignores most of the sounds that we as human beings would hear and that would be relevant to us. And we are trying to get around that. This is another example. This is from Excel Wood. Uh, this is an environment which is absolutely non-existing from an acoustic point of view because there is no road traffic. Another example is the Shepherd's Weep. Uh, I walk there almost every day and quite a lot of people take their walks with the dogs along the uh, Porterbrook. Uh, probably because it has a very, very interesting acoustic environment. The silence, you don't hear that much road traffic and that twinkling, hurling sound of water. It doesn't count in today's, uh, the way we uh, approach acoustic environments. Uh, from a scientific point of view today. And part of that is probably because uh, architects are not involved. It's mainly engineers who bother about the acoustic environment and everything we try to do is making it quieter. And actually we have been trying to make the acoustic environment quieter for the last 60 years. It's actually not getting quieter, it's actually getting worse. And the reason for that is because we have managed to make e each individual car quieter, but we have so much more cars today. And part of that is urbanization, a failure in urban planning, and because the architects were never involved. And that's what we like to change. We would like to involve the architects and the urban planners, planners and also think about the acoustic environment because it matters to people. So if we would like to promote a sustainable urban development in the future where urbanization is going to continue we need to have the architects on board it's not just the engineers that, that should be concerned so let me introduce the concept of soundscape to you uh, this is the international now acknowledged international definition of soundscape acoustic environment as perceived or experienced and or understood 
by a person or people in context. Sorry, I lost the word by that. Uh, it was published now in September this year uh, by the ISO, International Organization for Standardization. Uh, so th there is a movement that has started trying to involve more people in thinking about the management of the acoustic environment and not only to think of it from an engineering point of view in terms of uh, sound pressure levels but also in terms of the human experience. And when we look at the human experience of sound, this is what we get. Uh, it's a two-dimensional model of how people perceive sound. If you ask people, put words on your experience of sound, you would get this. You would get pleasant and you would get eventual. So we have two dimensions here which you can't see because the color doesn't work, but uh, you don't even, probably don't even see the shifts here. You have pleasantness, you have eventfulness, uh, you have calmness, you have excitingness, and this is very much related to uh, the sort of sounds that would be present. Uh, these blackbirds actually uh, represent natural sounds. Natural sounds would produce something which is pleasant or calm, normally, in most cases. Not in every case, but in, in most cases. Technological sounds most people would find annoying, whereas the sound of human would create eventfulness. And basically you could use these elements to design soundscapes by just being aware how they influence the experience people have of an environment. If you would like to produce a calm environment, you should remove the cars and the people and allow nature to be there. If you like a vibrant environment, such as a downtown area, you would like people there, but not that much nature, not that much technology. And if you certainly would like to annoy people, remove the people, remove the nature, get cars into the place, if that's what you, for some reason, would like to do. I can't imagine why. If you look at what people like, and this is in color, Whoops. Uh, I guess the red color is gone. Uh, this is what people here in Sheffield said when I asked them, what kind of sounds would you like to hear in an urban park? They like to have nature, natural sounds. They like them to dominate quite, uh, quite heavily. They can accept sound of individuals, but they don't want sounds you know, sound to crowd, and definitely not sounds of technology such as cars. It's quite interesting, urban park. We don't want to hear cars in an urban park. If you go downtown, such as Fargate or those areas in the city centre around the, the, in the town hall, people can accept natural sounds, the sound of the individuals, sounds of crowd and a little bit sound of technology. So downtown you can accept technology sound, but not in an urban park. If you go rural, natural area out like the Peak District. This is what people could accept to hear. Natural sounds, sounds of individuals, but no crowds and no technology. And these we could use as some guidelines for how to design different environments. What is it people want? What do they want to experience relative to the place and its function? And it's, as you see, I've divided up three different functions. Downtown, such as the square, urban park, and more recreational uh, outside, the, uh, outside the urban environment. So what we did this summer, uh, actually Francesco should tell, yeah, the red is gone. Uh, this is red, uh, for those who can't see that. Uh, <coughs> do you think it's, yeah, never mind. Uh, what we did, we sent a student out uh, to record in 90, Wow, we got it red. Thank you. Uh, this is technol. Uh, well, what the student did was to go to 90 different places. We divided the Hill City Centre up in 100 times 100 meter squares. So the, the students went to the centre of each of those squares, 90 of them, and recorded what sounds he heard. Uh, these blobs represent where he could hear technology. These represent where he could hear people. And these blobs represent what he 
could hear nature. So try to map out, instead of mapping the sound levels as the noise maps out, we were trying to map out what sounds do you hear and how could people uh, perceive that. Uh, that's the next step. We haven't taken that step yet. But that's an example of how we're trying to move this forward. And we're trying to move this forward in a, in a project in, should I say the place? Yes, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Brighton. Uh, it's called the Valley Garden. And this is from a sound walk we did now in October. Uh, Francesco did a sound walk in October. And the colored bit that you see is how appropriate is the soundscape for these environments. And as you can see, red means absolutely not appropriate and green means appropriate. And as, as you can see, the green space up there, see if I can get a pointer here, that is the Roy Pavilion in, in, in Brighton. That's the only place which, where we found the, the soundscape to be appropriate. And that's not even included in the area we're working with. It's a reference place. So basically, the, the test site we're working on showing that the soundscape is absolutely awful. And they say they like to, to try to change that, but we don't believe them because they, they like to, to run traffic right through the whole area. Uh, so we think they may be barking up the wrong tree. Uh, what that, again, an example of how we're trying to move this forward, working together with the City Council in Brighton and helping them to, to think more about the sound, uh, the acoustic environment from a human perspective, the human experience, rather than just from a sound, uh, sound level point of view. And that's the presentation we had for this morning. Uh, later on today we're going to run a workshop in which we will run some more exercises and let you try some of this. Uh, we have about seven minutes left, and if you have any questions, any thoughts, any feedback at this moment in, uh, in time that you'd like to share with us, that will be most welcome. Sorry, may I ask about the actual design of the process? Yeah. Is the furniture playing a role about the acoustic slides, the material of the furniture? Not yeah. only the material of the wall or the ceiling. Is this uh, furniture playing a role about the sound of the yeah. design? Even we play a, a yeah. role in sound. Uh, the amount of hair you have on your head. Yeah, so that. <laughs> <laughs> your clothes, everything. So, so you, would, you, you would have a different acoustic environment in, in a heavy metal concept where everyone has long hair, uh, whereas if you go to uh, uh, the, the uh, Balkan area in, uh, in, in London and listen to concepts uh, where people have very short hair, you would have a different, uh, different acoustic environment. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, even the hair would absorb, so you need to take that into consideration when you design a concept for how much people are going, am I going to put into this space, um, and how soft is the material going to be on the shelves, mm -hmm. everything counts. So we need to know uh, the kind of materials we have here yes. inside the building. Yes. So is there any other uh, plans for this uh, usually, usual design? Usually when you browse the materials, when you go to buy some, the companies are providing you with technical specification. So you will have a spectrum of absorption for every material. But, uh, apart from that, there are also some references in literature saying concrete has this spectrum for absorption. And, uh, but in the software that we are going to introduce this afternoon, uh, it's funny because you can also add people as material. So, and according to the clothes, as Austin was saying, like some material, maybe cotton or wool. wool. So this would affect. It. And another common issue is that uh, acquisitions tend to uh, make simulations of concert halls when they are empty. So this is okay. What if we put people inside? Okay. One thing that's important to add is this is principles for building physics. So today we're giving you a, a sort of overview of the principles of acoustic design. When you go out into practice, if you were, were working on a concert hall, you'd expect to work with a professional acoustician. So we're not expecting you by the end of the day to all be acousticians. But what we'd like you to do is be, be, be aware. And then when you when you go when you're designing know the issues you need to think about and also it means when you then go out and practice and you're, you're 
people talking to the, the acoustic specialists that you sort of understand some of the issues that, that are involved? Um, that is also going to be more and more uh, important when you design facades of buildings. Uh, there's quite a lot of research now on, on how you can use facades of buildings as, uh, as noise barriers or green roofs uh, to, to reduce the sound levels in, in cities as well. Uh, so that, that will also be an aspect. So it's not just the indoor, it's also what you do with the outdoor environment. And uh, Francesco sh showed you this uh, uh, Helmholtz resonator with, with the tube with the bowl. Uh, that you also try to, uh, try to, to use as facade material to basically put a lot of uh, resonators on the facade which give it a different design, but it also helps to absorb the sound in the environment. So quite a lot of things going on there. In, in one of the lectures in, I think it's in two weeks' time, I'm going to show you the design of, a, of an academy which, which I was the architect for. And you'll see in that presentation that the, the entire concept of that design was driven by the acoustics of the site. Because the site is too noisy, you could not just open the window because you're bringing in the background noise. And it was amazing that, that everything about that design, the structure, the materials, the ventilation strategy, the lighting strategy, it was all driven by that acoustic approach to the sound. Uh, and what you're saying you now with, with uh, outdoor noise uh, and how it affects the indoor environment is also increasingly important many parts of the world because of urbanization. Uh, the most energy efficient way of, uh, of ventilating your house is simply opening a window, but in many parts of the world you wouldn't do that because you will get air pollution, you will get all the noise in, into your house, uh, and that is becoming a major issue in, in many urban planning uh, projects now, particularly in, in the uh, developing part of the world. Can I ask you a question? In your architectural education so far, put your hands up if you think that you have considered acoustic design in your projects. In the future? No, in, in the past. <laughs> in the future, of course. <laughs> Any, anybody think they've considered acoustics before? Please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A few of you, yeah. Yeah, which is what I would expect. I mean, I think in this school of architecture as well, we, you know, we would think very much about light, about materials, about maybe heating systems, and I think quite often we forget acoustic design. So you know, it's really interesting that it's such an important criteria, and, and yet it's, it's being missed. Um, do you have any specific um, example with removing cars in the environment was successful? I'm from Mexico, we have lots of problems with this. Mexico City? Yeah, well, okay. uh, especially in, in Puebla, near Mexico City. But we also have these uh, traffic problems, and this is like very good uh, car pollution. So we try to, to get this um, sound of um, tasks. But we don't know how to solve it. I mean, it's so chaotic that we don't find like any any example to follow. Okay, uh, there are some examples. Uh, there are even an example in Sweden where they simply drag the road down, they tunnel it, and so they remove the whole road and, and build it under the under the ground instead. Uh, but that is the most extreme example. I know some discussions uh, where they like to to tunnel the road away simply. Uh, Build a concrete wall all over, all over the place uh, to get rid of the road. Yeah, because um, the problem was uh, in Puebla we have a river that goes out of the city. So doing this it was not um, easy to get any yeah. view yeah. because the river is in another part of the city. Well, the problem is that most politicians are hesitant to accept such, such drastic uh, measures because they're afraid of what their road users are going to say about it. Uh, so in many places, they care more about people uh, riding cars uh, than people living in the area. Uh, and that, that, that's also uh, quite a 
that we should take into consideration. But definitely, the, I mean, the quickest solution to the problems that we face today would actually be to ban cars. Uh, it, it will solve so many problems, uh, except transportation problems. Yeah, let's look at raw examples. Copenhagen, Zurich are exemplars of public transport, sustainable transport, cycling. You know, Copenhagen, I can't remember now, it's something like 80% of journeys, commuting journeys are done by bike. In, in Zurich, public transport dominates. So, you know, there are, there are really good examples of that. Yeah, if you have to reply, Copenhagen is a very good example. Yeah, I think the big problem is um, about um, the government wants to be like, you know, like they're building some type of roads. So there are behind six um, car roads, so it's very dangerous to go. Mm -hmm. um, they are really trying, but they are not very sure about it. So, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a big political issue. Yeah. Um, it's particularly hot when it, when it comes to America, because you, you follow the North American model, where car is king, that's the way to move around. Yeah. I mean, try, try to walk through an American city. Uh, you get you get caught by the police because you're walking. Yeah, that's you're not supposed true. to yeah, do that. You know, there was a statistic in the future bill, uh, one of the keynote presentations on Wednesday, I, I put that slide on, on the SAS website where the speaker was saying if a, um, if a pedestrian on the ratio of space in a city, the pedestrian is one, a bike takes up seven times as much space, a car takes up 90 times as much space. So if you, if you walk to work, one, if you cycle, seven, you drive 90 times as much space. Which is why, part of why an American city becomes so spread. So what, there was an interesting, we had a lecture last year from our our visiting professor of acoustics, Professor Raphael Lowski. One of the projects he's working on now is what noise should electric cars make? Because electric cars are too quiet, and the trouble is people can get knocked over. <laughs> there, is, there are some class actions by blind societies. Yes. yes. Of people so so he, he's now working on a project whereby they're trying to decide what noise what level of noise, what type of noise should electric cars make? And it's amazing that we're now putting the noise back in. Like yeah. What well, we're hoping for is, of course, when, when everyone dri drives an electric car, the problem will be solved by itself because then people will be more aware. Because the problem with the low uh, amount of noise from an electric car today is that it's masked by all the other cars. Uh,